1965 was a momentous year in American history. The United States started bombing North Vietnam with Operation Rolling Thunder, and U.S. combat troops arrived in country for the first time, starting a new phase in the Vietnam War. The United States invaded the Dominican Republic, Malcolm X was assassinated, and Mariner IV passed by Mars. But one of the biggest stories of 1965 went unreported in the news. In fact, it was kept secret for decades. Perhaps the single most dangerous U.S. military nuclear accident in history. The December 5th, 1965, A-4 Philippine Sea Incident deserves to be remembered. By 1965, the United States had more than 30,000 nuclear weapons, a number that would peak in 1966 before declining. Since the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the bombs have never been used in warfare, but they were constantly ready for use at a moment's notice. Among the safeguards put into place to avoid the potential for a devastating nuclear accident in this massive arsenal was the formation of the Atomic Energy Commission, which in the first years after World War II kept control of the actual nuclear material in the hands of civilians instead of the military. Use of nuclear weapons in conflict in Korea was, according to Truman, always on the table, although it required presidential authorization. Numerous figures suggested their use either in certain situations or to discourage Chinese intervention in the war. Douglas MacArthur, commander of the UN forces engaged in Korea, asked for discretion to use nuclear weapons in the event of retreat. When the Joint Chiefs questioned MacArthur about the use of nuclear weapons in the event of Soviet or Chinese escalation, MacArthur provided a list of hypothetical targets that would require the use of 34 atomic weapons. Ultimately, disagreements regarding strategy and insubordination in the form of comments to the press would lead Truman to relieve MacArthur in a still controversial decision. In a speech outlining his decision on April 13, 1951, Truman explained, I believe that we must try to limit the war to Korea to prevent a third world war. A number of events have made it evident that General MacArthur did not agree with that policy. No nuclear weapons were ultimately used in the fighting in Korea, but the United States remained at high alert during the 1950s and 60s as part of the American strategy to maintain a threat of mutually assured destruction. From 1960 to 1968, a large part of the strategy involved Operation Chrome Dome, in which American planes with armed nuclear weapons would remain in flight at all times, a significant shift from the initial plan to keep nuclear material separate from actual weapons and the subject of another episode of The History Guy. This change in policy was a reaction to developments by the Soviet Union. In 1949, just four years after the U.S. first tested the nuclear weapon in the Trinity test, Soviet scientists detonated their first nuclear weapon. American experts were surprised by how fast the Soviets were catching up to American nuclear technology. The same year, the reach of communism grew significantly with the formation of the People's Republic of China, which seemed to further threaten American interests. Air Force General Curtis LeMay, in charge of the American Strategic Air Command, pressed for greater access to nuclear weapons, so they would be available in case rapid nuclear response was necessary. The development of intercontinental ballistic missiles also required all nuclear weapons to be armed and easily ready for potential use. The dangers of this kind of nuclear proliferation became quickly apparent. In February 1950, a Convair B-36 crashed in British Columbia while on a simulated bombing run. Not revealed to the public at the time was that the bomber had been carrying a Mark IV nuclear bomb. It was the first Broken Arrow incident, an incident in which a nuclear weapon is accidentally launched, detonated, or lost. The bomb has still not been recovered to this day. As in Korea, the United States intended to keep their options open in the growing conflict in Vietnam, a war which quickly came to represent the battle between communism and democracy abroad. During the war, large numbers of nuclear weapons were moved to stations in the Pacific, such as Guam, Okinawa, the Philippines, and Taiwan. By mid-1963, the U.S. had around 2,400 nuclear weapons in their onshore stockpile in the Pacific. But these were not the only weapons deployed in the region. In addition to missiles and planes, numerous nuclear weapons were stored on ships. In 1965, more than 10% of the total nuclear stockpile was at sea more nuclear weapons in the entire current U.S. stockpile, including aboard aircraft carriers. Numerous Navy planes were capable of launching nuclear weapons, including the Grumman A-6 Intruder, the LTV A-7 Corsair II, the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom II, 
and the Douglas A4 Skyhawk. Introduced in 1956, the Douglas A-4 Skyhawk was a Delta-winged light-attack aircraft capable of carrying the B-43 nuclear bomb. Developed in 1956 by Los Alamos National Laboratories to be carried by both heavy bombers and smaller fighter-bomber aircraft. The B-43 was a variable-yield thermonuclear weapon, which had two variants with five yield options between 70 kilotons and one megaton. For the relatively small, subsonic A-4 Skyhawk, dropping the bomb would have been a dangerous for the crew, so the bombs were sometimes equipped with parachutes to slow the descent and give the pilots a chance to escape. The plane was also equipped with a thermal shield that could be used to block the blinding light from the actual detonation. The aircraft carrier USS Ticonderoga was an Essex-class carrier built during World War II. She was originally commissioned in 1944 and recommissioned 10 years later in 1954. The Ticonderoga had been involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident, sending aircraft to defend a U.S. destroyer attacked by North Vietnamese torpedo boats on August 2, 1964. The incident led directly to the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which allowed President Lyndon Johnson to intervene in Southeast Asia. In March of 1965, the first American ground troops landed in South Vietnam. The Ticonderoga was overhauled at the beginning of 1965, but returned to the Pacific near the end of the year arriving at Dixie Station on November 5th. Her first tour in Vietnam lasted six months, and planes from the carrier launched more than 10,000 combat sorties. As with all American aircraft carriers and many other surface ships in the period, she carried nuclear weapons, which could be ready at a moment's notice. According to declassified documents, American carriers often carried as many as 100 nuclear weapons at any one time. American strategists were especially concerned about a possibility of military intervention from China, as they had been in Korea. The carriers were a major part of the American plan for potential nuclear war. In December of 1965, the Ticonderoga was en route to the port at Yokosuka, Japan, for maintenance and rest. According to Chief Petty Officer Delbert Mitchell, an aviation ordnance man on board the ship, on Sunday, December 5th, Captain Robert Miller authorized a crew cut, a training exercise that involved loading a nuclear weapon. The plan was to load an A-4E Skyhawk with a B-43 nuclear bomb. The plane would be loaded on the port catapult, but not launch. It would then be brought back below decks. Mitchell and his loading crew assembled in hangar bay number two around 1.30 in the afternoon. At 2 o'clock, the bomb arrived, covered with a gray tarp and escorted by two armed marines. Mitchell told the Naval History magazine, the W Division personnel removed the tarp from the weapon, and we all immediately identified it as a live B-43 thermonuclear weapon. We were flabbergasted by what we saw. On the side of the weapon was the symbol... Y1, meaning that it had a 1 megaton yield. That meant that the bomb had an explosive yield of about 1 million tons of TNT. By comparison, Fat Man, the bomb dropped on Nagasaki in 1945, had a yield of only 21,000 tons. Each member of the crew had a checklist, and Mitchell's job was to verify that the weapon was on safe and report it to the crew chief. The bomb was tucked underneath the Skyhawk and hydraulically lifted into place on the plane's bomb rack. Once it was in place, the ordnance crew's job was done until the plane returned. 24-year-old Lieutenant Junior Grade Douglas Webster was assigned to fly. Webster had flown 17 sorties into Vietnam at that point, as part of the VA-56 Skyhawk Squadron, nicknamed the Champions. After checking the plane, Webster entered the cockpit. Next, plane handlers pushed the plane onto the number two plane elevator, where it would be raised to the flight deck. The elevator sat at the edge of the deck, with one side open to the sea. A low safety rail was in place, along with a net meant to catch anyone who slipped from the elevator. The plane was pushed with the rear of the plane facing the open side of the elevator and had to be pushed over a lip between the elevator and the deck. But around the same time, the carrier made a slight turn and the deck leaned towards the ocean. Suddenly, Mitchell recalls, the plane directors began to blow their whistles frantically while crossing their fist, directing the pilot to set his brakes. But the Skyhawk kept rolling. Webster appeared oblivious and was looking down even as the crew ran towards the rolling plane. One of the plane handlers managed to throw a chalk under one of the plane's tires, which caused the plane to pivot to the right as the port main gear mount hit the netting on the aircraft elevator. This caused the main mount to break through the steel netting and the Skyhawk lifted itself and fell inverted into the ocean. As the rear wheels rolled off, the bottom of the plane slammed against the deck. In the book Brotherhood of Doom, James Little, another witness, says he saw Webster's face in the instant before it fell. I'll never forget the startled look on his face. Well, this happened in a matter of seconds, but it was as if it was happening in slow motion. 
The plane pushers, marines, and all of us stood there in stunned shock. Mitchell said, We never saw Lieutenant Webster after he climbed into the cockpit or what efforts he might have attempted to get out of the Skyhawk, but we were stunned to witness a plane, pilot, and nuclear weapon fall. Upside down, the landing gear stuck out of the water as the plane sank. Despite their shock, efforts to recover Lieutenant Webster were immediately made. The carrier came to a stop, dispatching a helicopter to recover the pilot, but he didn't come up. Two nearby destroyers, the Gridley and the Turner Joy, were called in to search the area, and a whaleboat and crew was launched. The only sign of the accident that could be found was Webster's helmet, which, according to Mitchell, he hadn't been wearing at the time of the accident. With the canopy open, Mitchell says, the force of the Skyhawk hitting the water would have seriously injured him as the canopy closed. It's unlikely, Mitchell thinks, that Webster was able to make much of an effort to escape the doomed craft. Little wrote, I've often thought of the horror of those final moments of that young pilot's life as he plunged down into the dark depths of the sea, with the sunlight on the surface rapidly disappearing, knowing that he was entombed within his coffin, plummeting to his grave. Little dedicated his book to Lieutenant Webster, who gave his life for his country while ensuring readiness for nuclear war. After searching for several hours, the Navy gave up and returned to their scheduled activities. The deck log of the Ticonderoga mentions the event only briefly. At 1450, while being rolled from number 2 hangar bay to number 2 elevator, A4E aircraft rolled off the elevator and sank in 2,700 fathoms of water. 2,700 fathoms equates to more than 16,000 feet deep, deeper than where the Titanic lays. In the minutes after the accident, a message was sent from the carrier indicating a broken arrow incident. President Johnson was notified, but his itinerary that day suggests he did nothing special following the news. Exactly what went wrong is a matter of speculation. The brakes had been checked just prior to Webster entering the plane and were determined to be in working order. What Webster was looking at in the cockpit is, of course, unknown. It's possible there was some kind of mechanical error that Webster was unable to reach the brakes. Whatever the case, the plane, pilot, and bomb were never recovered. The loss of nuclear weapons was an obvious potential disaster for the U.S. military. The fallout of the loss of four nuclear weapons over Palomares, Spain in 1966 resulted in a PR disaster, with significant political fallout including banning plans carrying nuclear weapons from Spanish airspace. Knowing the potential political consequences, LeMay had chosen simply to keep this broken arrow incident a state secret. In the absence of other witnesses, the Navy and U.S. government chose to cover up the loss of the weapon. The Pentagon only admitted to the accident in 1981, and then saying only that a nuclear weapon had been lost in international waters in 1965. At the time, they did not admit to a location, said only that it occurred 500 miles from land. It wasn't until 1989, 24 years after the incident, that the details of the accident were fully revealed. There were reasons the Pentagon did not want to release the details. A May 10th, 1989 issue of the Miami Herald notes, the U.S. Navy had concealed details of the loss of the bomb for 24 years because it was eager to hide the presence of nuclear weapons aboard vessels waging the Vietnam War and because of fear of feeding Japan's apprehension of atomic weapons. The accident was only acknowledged when William Arkin, an investigative journalist and former Army intelligence officer, released copies of the ship's log obtained from the National Archives. Arkin expressed shock that at the time these ships were engaged in the Vietnam War, they were armed with nuclear weapons. At a press conference, Arkin lamented, For 24 years, the U.S. Navy has covered up the most politically sensitive accident that has ever taken place. Perhaps as politically sensitive as the idea that U.S. ships participating in the war in Vietnam were carrying nuclear weapons was the fact that the accident took place only 80 miles from the Japanese Ryukyu Islands. The 1960 Japan-U.S. Security Treaty required prior consultation for the U.S. to carry nuclear weapons into Japan. The incident implied that the Japanese government was looking the other way when U.S. vessels carrying nuclear weapons entered Japanese ports. In fact, Ticonderoga had been heading for Tokyo Bay when the accident occurred. The Miami Herald noted, The Japanese, who find nuclear weapons particularly painful because of the World War II bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, reacted with surprise and outrage to revelations that the bomb remained submerged so close to Japanese territory. An op-ed in the Iowa City Press Citizen was more direct. The Japanese are miffed because, as a matter of polite political hypocrisy, it is pretended that we do not bring atomic weapons into Japanese territories. The event caused an international incident that strained U.S.-Japan relations and a diplomatic inquiry, and Japanese protesters picketed the American embassy in Tokyo. Mitchell told Naval History magazine in 2019, 
Sometimes I think back to this incident, and after 54 years, it still haunts me. Since 1950, the U.S. military has admitted to 36 Broken Arrow events. Six nuclear weapons lost by the U.S. military have never been recovered. But the 1965 incident is unique. Unlike every other acknowledged Broken Arrow incident, when Lieutenant Webster's plane fell into the Philippine Sea, the weapon aboard was fully armed, including the nuclear pit that is necessary for a detonation. The only active nuclear weapon ever to be lost by the United States. The Navy maintains that the weapon broke up before it reached the ocean bottom, that the bomb parts have decayed, and that there is no threat of a detonation. And amongst it all, there is one more loss that needs to be acknowledged. Lieutenant Douglas Webster's name is not on the Vietnam War Memorial, despite several efforts to have it inscribed there. Michael Rawl, his stepbrother, said, Doug was a superlative guy. He was decisive and strong-willed, and he had just married a beautiful young woman. He had all the characteristics to be top-notch, a leader, wherever he went, in any field. Chief Petty Officer Mitchell told the Naval Institute Press, Fair winds and following seas, Lieutenant Junior Grade Douglas Webster, I, for one, have not forgotten you. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community at Locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop, book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 